Pastor Martin, it's so good to have you here for the last session here this afternoon. So let's stand together again, give honor where honor is due. Pastor Martin Steele. Thank you so much, Gideon. God bless you. I hope you had a great lunch. We certainly did. Refueling. Uh, trust the chef, right? We started this morning saying this will be a bit of an eclectic mix of messages. And on the screen, guys, if we can throw up the... There's an image there where there's a bowl of flour and yeast. And then next to it is there's a spiritual, religious-looking picture with Paul the Apostle with a glow around his head. If we can jump to that slide. That's the one. And we'll just hold that there for a moment. All right. This last session, and I don't want to take too long with it, but I do want to um, bring some application because we spoke earlier today about the whole concept of the apostolic church, the ecclesia of God, the kingdom of God, and what's meant for influence in all these different ways. And um, I want to now touch on this whole concept of what it means to be an apostolic people. Because my measurement when I ascertain whether a church is apostolic or not is not its label, it's not its denominational title or independent title, it's not even that it's led by an apostle or that you're accessing apostolic grace, although we know those things are important. You know, that basically they're Christos, they're, they're Charis Christos, grace gifts of Christ. He ascended, he gave apostles, he gave prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists to empower us to do the work of the ministry. And uh, no one said that ministry is limited only to church ministry, it's ministry. And so, um, you know, he, he is the empowering one. So every church must be ac accessing apostolic grace. You must be accessing evangelistic grace. You must be accessing teacher grace and pastoral grace and prophetic grace, but that's not what makes it an apostolic church. What makes a church an apostolic church is, is it filled with apostolic people. So are you an apostle? I don't mean necessarily an ascension gift apostle who's meant to empower the church, but are you an apostle in the marketplace? Are you an apostle in your area of interest? Are you an apostle in your community? You're like, I don't know. What is an apostle? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verse 13, and in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, verse 13, one night Jesus went up the mountain, and after he'd prayed all night long, he came down and called out the 12 disciples, and he named them and appointed them apostles. Well, that's pretty freaky. Actually, it's more than freaky. If you were a Jewish follower of Christ, a disciple, the principle of biblical Judaic um, discipleship was that you were following a rabbi so that you could become like this rabbi. These lads, even though they were fishermen, which for a start, most of them, and tax collectors and other, other vocations, were already overawed by the fact they got called to become disciples. But they knew that their ultimate um, ladder of pathway to influence was they were going to either become priests, rabbis, or just continue as a disciple. And then Jesus comes and drops the A-bomb. He calls them apostles. And unlike us, they didn't, freak out because they didn't know what an apostle was. They freaked out because they knew exactly what an apostle was. Now, remember how I told you earlier that Jesus is recorded, not just by Christian theologians, but by secular historians, as the first person ever to use the term church, ecclesia, outside of a political environment. He reached out over and above religious language. He didn't say, I'm going to build my synagogue. He didn't say, I'm going to build my temple. He didn't even say, I'm going to build my faith community. So I'm going to build an ecclesia. A gathering of people who come together for the betterment of society and transformation. He did the same radical thing with apostle. Because the apostle was not a ministry or priesthood term. It wasn't rabbi, it wasn't priest. It wasn't prophet. It was a political military term. And some of you may already know this. Apostolos. And an apostolos with a Roman or a Greek. Remember, the Roman and the Greek empires were the political empires. You're like, why did Jesus keep referencing the Roman and empire and the, and the Greek empire when they were Jewish? Well, because as you may or may not know, of course, in biblical times when Jesus walked the earth, Israel was part of the Roman empire. And most of us would know that, right? We've learned that. I, I learned that when I became a believer. Oh, wow. So when Jesus came, Israel was under the control of the Roman Empire. They had Caesars, they had um, all the different Roman Empire, they had to pay tax to, to Rome. Like, so of course he referenced it, because Jesus is contemporary. So the language he was using was literally 
when he said to his disciples, you shall become apostles, they knew exactly what an apostle was because they would see these apostles every single day. Let me tell you what an apostle is. An apostle, apostolos, was a Roman general who was sent. The term we translate biblically, we say apostolos, literally in Greek means sent one. But it doesn't just mean sent one, it means sent an emissary, missionary, emissary, a, a representative with a singular purpose. They were a Roman general who were never sent to conquer or fight. They were sent after the fight, after the conquering. So when the Roman Empire expanded and you know, took over Britannia or Britain or, or Gaul or France or, 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 or Silesia or, or Thracia, you know, Bulgaria, modern-day Balkans. When the Roman Empire conquered, they didn't go in like some conquerors, Genghis Khan and others, who literally went and just annihilated and then took the wealth and then repossessed. The Roman Empire actually believed that they were God's gift to society. <laughs> arrogant, arrogant, but true. They actually believed that they were bringing a better kingdom. So they would rock up into Europe as the Roman Empire and they would overcome, Italy, uh, overcome Greek, um, Macedonia or, or Britannia and they would say, this is ridiculous. Your people live in poverty. Your people walk for two miles to get a bucket of water that's stagnant and half spilt when it gets back. We actually have engineers and designers who bring water to the city and remove the sewage. And we have aqueducts and viaducts. And, you know, they'll tell you today that the, the Romans build all the roads and they build all the... I mean, I've traveled. My wife and I worked in Europe for years and years in Eastern Europe. We still go into towns in Europe, Bulgaria and places like that, where these Roman aqueducts are still there today functioning 2,000 years later. And the Romans actually believed they had a greater civilization. And so when Jesus would reference the Roman Empire, it's not because he was endorsing it, with all its variants of values and other things, it was because he knew the people would grasp the concept that the kingdom of God was not the kingdom of Rome, nor was it the kingdom of Israel. It was actually a kingdom that was superior to any human kingdom that if brought and introduced its values, the, the origins of God, the purposes of God, the values of Christ and the kingdom would actually better society. Yeah. But in the Roman Empire... When a nation had been conquered and the Romans didn't go there to pillage them and take their wealth and bring it back to Rome, they actually believed they were expanding their empire, they would send an apostolos once a nation was conquered or a city was conquered. And the sent one, the emissary, the apostolos, was mandated with one thing and one thing alone, to bring the culture of Rome to the newly acquired territory and see it transformed and they would say that the measurement of success of an apostle was that if the Caesar visited that place, he'd feel at home. Sounds just like Jesus. He sends out his apostles, apostolos, to bring transformation to this world so that when he comes, he will feel heaven on earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done on heaven as it is on earth. We refer to these things all the time. Hmm. So these apostles were known to the Jews. They, they, they witnessed apostles. They knew that actually even Israel was under apostolic, Roman apostolic influence. They'd see these generals walking around who would want to see the culture change. We want to see things done here just like in Rome. So Jesus gets his disciples who think they're going to become rabbis, maybe priests if they were Aaronic in their, Aaronic in their background with heritage, but predominantly rabbis, and he says, oh, by the way, I'm appointing you as my apostles, my architects of culture. You want a modern-day language for apostle? You're an architect of culture. So if you're apostolic in media or if you're apostolic in business or if you're apostolic in politics or if you're involved in social work, what does it mean to be an apostolos? Because we're not bringing the kingdom of Kiwi or the kingdom of, of Rome or the kingdom of Israel. We're bringing the kingdom of God what, is, what would social work look like when the values of heaven are translated into social work in New Zealand? Because of your apostolos, primary goal is to be responsible to see the culture change. We talked at lunch about dominionism, you know, the extreme of everything. Everything's a bell curve, by the way. You, you talk about kingdom stuff, you'll have people on the far end of the extreme that take it too far, and you have people on the other end who take it nowhere. <laughs> I've learned in life that you never let your church be governed by the two extremities. Yeah. I remember Pastor Paul de Jong about 15 years ago said, Martin, I want you to do a session at Life Conference to all senior pastors on how to be a supernatural but contemporary church. 
He says, because I think you guys are doing it reasonably well, right? And we always joke about ourselves. We ne- us pastors will never say we're doing great because we're not. But we'll talk about, yeah, we're not doing too bad. He goes, I think you guys are doing reasonably well at that, aren't you? And I, I'm like, yeah, that's one of the things we're doing well. Other stuff you're doing much better and we're doing terribly. So we learn. But he says, would you teach on that? And it was so funny because I offended so many people. Because I actually started talking about being a spirit-filled, prophetic, supernatural, but also contemporary church, contemporary relevant to society. And I put up a picture of a bell curve on the PowerPoint. And on the left-hand side, I said, I said, you know, this is where you've got people here who are, who are really, really, really concerned about the supernatural church. And I had these... At the time, there was a stock photo thing where they'd been taken, which was a perspective of taking down on top of a person, looking up. So the head looked five times bigger than their body, and there was this guy pointing at his watch. And I said, this is, this is what some of you are, right? I said, I'm not going to let my church be governed by you. I said, that's the, that's the few people, that's the few percent in your church who are like, oh, these meetings, the worship went on like last night. The worship went on for an hour, 20 minutes. I said, I'm not going to let that demographic on the extreme government. And then the person next to it is the person doing this. And I said, that's the person, a group of people in the church who are like, oh, I don't want to bring anyone to church in case you've got to pray for a sick person, they fall over. Like, and I've got all of these pastors who are Holy Spirit focused, centered, as they would define themselves, going, amen, yes, amen. And, you know, because I'm talking about, you know, I'm not going to let that govern. So I said, now I want to talk to you guys who have been so noisy the last five minutes. And I said, I'm not going to let this person govern my church either. It was a picture of a person with a red clown hair on and the nose, like a clown on the end. And then another one next to them, these two clowns, and the room went silent. I shouldn't have done this, eh? I said, I've been to your churches. I've seen these people. They influence everything in your services. They're clowns, right? Now, I'm not, look, I'm probably even offending some of you now. But my point was the bell curve. My point was the bell curve, right? The bell curve is you don't go for mid-center, but don't let the extremities get you. Don't have someone who is so fearful of the supernatural that you tone your services down to nothing. Don't let someone who's just ridiculous and you know, crazy and everything would just be sort of like a clown show if they had their way influence the culture. Yeah. Right? You go for that mainstream thing. It's the same with the kingdom of God. The moment you start talking the kingdom of God, somebody will say, oh, that's extremism. You know, we're not called to change society. and That's dominion. That's that little percent on the end. And then, of course, it's the same on the other end where people are like, we've got to do this, even if it means military. We've got to bring the, you know. Jesus was never on the extremities, right? So coming back to this whole thing on apostolos, I needed to say that for a reason. Because some of you would still think, well, yeah, but what right have I got to bring the values of the kingdom into that social work? If it's not in my, as a teacher, what right do I have to bring the values of the kingdom of God when we're supposed to be an inclusive society? By God's grace, you know what it is. To create influences and apostolic. Lay hands on it and heal it. They told me last night if a microphone starts popping, it's 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 being fixed. Apostolos. This is all good. So now let's just quickly get down to why I've got the picture. Picture of Paul with a halo on his head. Okay. I want to share with you for a few minutes about a theme called everything is spiritual. Everything is spiritual. The challenge that we have is that we think that everything we do in church life, should I change this or no? Can I beat it? It's not on the mic, it's in the whole system. (laughs) It will come right. Let me just quickly pull this up. You guys doing good? Give me a moment just to pull this particular one up here. It's working well. Really quickly, in the, in the book of Acts chapter 17, we read these crazy words. Whilst Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. He reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who just happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them said, what babbler? 
What is he trying to say? Others said he seems to advocate foreign gods. And they said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. The people could not understand the message because it was foreign to them. So then they took him and brought him to a meeting in the Areopagus, where they said to him, what's this new teaching you're presenting? You're bringing strange ideas to us. We don't know what it means. And all the Athenians and foreigners who live there spend all their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas, just like Facebook, right? <laughs> Paul then stood up in the meeting and said, men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very spiritual. For I walked around and I looked carefully at your objects of worship, and I even found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Now, what you worship in ignorance, I'm about to proclaim to you. Let me just quickly unpack that to you, what it implies into your vocation and your calling in your day-to-day life. The lesson that we learn here is that Paul was in a pagan environment, and they were filled with two types of people, the Stoics and the Epicureans. The Stoics and the Epicureans are still in society today. You could almost put T-shirts on most people. I'm either an Epicurean or a Stoic. And in society at the time, the Stoics were the philosophers. Everything was ethereal. Everything was sort of, you know, this concept of science and work. And and Epicureans meant hedonists, lovers of pleasure. And you think about society today, you know, there's people who are trying to figure out life and the philosophies of life and life systems and all this. And there's other people just like, oh, man, I don't care. I just like... I just like enjoying myself, you know, let's have a lovely family, let's build a nice home with a nice landscape, let's go out and get drunk, let's do that. This is just normal society. And Paul rocks up and starts preaching about Jesus, and both the Epicureans and the Stoics go, this is like, doesn't fit into either of our camps. This is weird stuff, can you teach us? And then Paul gathers together in the Arapagos, which was the social media center of the day. It was Facebook, it was Instagram. It was Twitter. It was the place people gathered to discuss new ideas. And they said, tell us this new idea you're teaching about a resurrection and a man called Jesus. And he starts off by saying to them, oh, by the way, I perceive that all of you are very spiritual. And then he goes on and says, I've walked around and I've seen things. The word in, in, in Greek means I have carefully observed and analyzed. And the word very spiritual means, he says, and the word there means in all things inclusively, he says everything you do is spiritual. Now, some of us would say that was an icebreaker. Like, hey, lovely home. Thanks for inviting me in. Oh, what a nice office you have when you're about to try and sell that person your product. No, no, it wasn't an icebreaker. The language that's used here is Paul says, I carefully have spent days in your town and observed you and analyzed. And I've come to this understanding that in everything you do and everything you are, you are very spiritual people. What he basically said is everything is spiritual. I want to suggest to you that we park the church and the kingdom here and say that's spiritual. And then we put everything else in society the media, arts, business, vocation, education, and we put those into the non-spiritual camp. Oh, that's intellectual, or that's entertainment, or that. What if I was to suggest to you that in God's viewpoint, everything is spiritual, and every pursuit of humanity is spiritual in its essence? Now, I know if I just teach like a teacher, I'm going to bore you. So let me give you a real life example. Let's go to the next screen slide, which will freak you out when I first put it up there. Wow. Some of you who love clothing and fashion are going, oh, that's awesome. Others are going, why does he put that up there? Well, the reason is because I was teaching at a conference in Nelson about nine years ago, not on the subject. And it's really annoying when you're teaching and the Holy Spirit starts to interrupt you. I love it when he wants to interrupt me with something I'm already doing. But this was contrary. And I just keep getting this impression, like I'm literally standing here, it was a conference, about 300 people, and I keep feeling a pull from over on my left. And then the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says, there's somebody in the meeting here who's studied fashion and involved in the fashion industry. And what I've found, I don't know what, how it works for you guys, but... Often God gives me the word of knowledge, but he doesn't give me the prophetic word, right? And I actually just stopped and I said, oh, I can't go on. I said, look, 
I said, I know this is going to sound totally out of context, but is there someone here, I said, and I think you're in this area, where you are involved in fashion and have studied fashion? And I hear a little bit of noise and giggling, and then this girl stands up. I think her name was Lucy from memory. Stands up. And she's probably about 26, 27, you know, very personable looking person and a bit nervous and smiling. And I'm like, um, are you involved in fashion? She goes, yeah, I'm a fashion designer. I actually have a fashion label. I'm like, that's cool, but have you studied fashion? She says, yes, I actually graduated from university, um, you know, with an arts degree, creative degree in fashion. I'm like, well, that's awesome, Lucy, because God's got something he wants to tell you. I'm just being real with you, right? I don't know if it ever happens to you. As I said that, I realize I, he hasn't told me what I've got to tell her. It was only a word of knowledge, right? Hmm. And so I look at her, and then the Holy Spirit tells me what to tell her. And I'm going to be open and transparent with you. This is how it happened. I looked at her and said, Lucy, the Holy Spirit wants to say to you, it's not vanity, it's glory. It's not vanity, it's glory. And as I'm saying it in my head, I'm going, no, it's not, it's vanity. <laughs> it's vanity. I said, it's not vanity, it's glory. The whole fashion industry, the thing you're involved in, it's not vanity, it's glory. And in my head, I'm saying to God, no, it's not. The whole fashion industry, God, is just based around vanity. I'm not talking about clothing, I'm talking about fashion. And then I start prophesying. It's very rarely I prophesy under what I would call almost um, autopilot, where you're almost literally not aware of what you're saying. God's just like, normally it's concept, you're communicating. This was an autopilot thing. This is what I actually prophesied. I said, Lucy, I said, do you understand that the whole fashion industry is driven by a desire and a search for the restoration of original glory, not vanity? And as I'm saying that, I'm like, I don't know that. I don't even agree with that, right? And she's looking at me like, and then everyone else is looking at me like, and I'm like, and I said these words, I said, look, I know like anything in society, things can be abused. I know that, that, that an emphasis on fashion can cause poor body image and affect kids. I said, I know we can have slave shops where they, 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 they have slavery almost, creating fashion and exorbitant prices. I said, but that's not the issue. The reason people desire fashion is it's a desire for the restoration of original glory. And then I'm like, is it? And then I paused, which is good to do. And I'm saying desperately, God, I don't even agree with this. Help me. Help me explain this. And literally, like an instant download, verses came into my mind, and this is what I said. I'll tell you verbatim what I said. I said, Lucy, in the original creation in the Garden of Eden, I said, when, when mankind was created, and the Bible says that they fell into sin and looked at each other, and by the way, it was probably, I didn't say it in a naughty way, but I probably didn't say it in a very sanitized way. <laughs> I just said what came out. I said, Adam and Eve, the moment they sinned, suddenly looked at each other and realized the Bible says they were naked. Now, I said, Eve didn't suddenly look at um, Adam and go, whoa, man, where did all that come from, right? And vice versa. I said, it wasn't the shock that they had naked bodies. I said, but what it means is they literally looked at each other and realized that they'd lost their clothing. They'd lost something that covered them. I said, do you realize before of the fall of mankind, they were literally clothed in the glory of God? Right. It was like a raiment on them. And then I started quoting out of Exodus and, and, and Isaiah, literal scriptures coming to mind of even how the, how the devil, Lucifer, was clothed in gold and gems and diamonds and, and this and, until he fell. And I said, actually, the Bible says that they realized they were naked. It wasn't because they took off a pair of jeans. It was literally the fact that they were covered in God's glory and it had gone. And they run and try and pick up a few leaves to cover them, and that's not going to work, especially with autumn and entropy, right? That stuff's going to not be there, right? And I'm literally saying this in a conference with Lucy standing there just looking at me going, and then starting to tear up. And I said, do you realize that the reason every person is possessed with a desire for fashion is because they know there's something missing? I said, it's not just Saks Fifth Avenue or New York, why people look at, oh, I want to wear that. I love your tie, Isaac. I, I said, and then this is where revelation comes. This is how you know it's kingdom. Because by the way, if it's kingdom culture, it works in every culture. 
If it can only work in the West, it's not kingdom. If it can only work in Africa, it's not kingdom. If it's universal. So I said, you know, if this was only true of the Western world, then I would challenge you to challenge my theology. But I said, you can find the most unreached people group and you'll walk in and you'll find they've got paint and feathers and bones. And it's a universal thing that everyone wants to be blinged out. Everyone wants to wear. Every, I said, it's because in eight in every human, in, in eight within, you know, we know we've lost something. I said, and even though it's a physical expression of something that was once physical, but is also spiritual and soulful, I said, do you realize the desire for fashion is driven by a desire for the restoration of lost glory? And then I stopped. And I said, Lucy, it's not vanity. It's glory. So now go and redeem and transform the fashion industry and bring it back to God's original purpose. Then I carried on preaching, thinking, oh, my goodness, what was all that about? At the end of the meeting, before even Lucy came to talk to me, her mother and sister came, sobbing. They said, you don't know what you just did. They said, our daughter is excellent in fashion. I actually got that afternoon to go to the family house and see her work and portfolios. It's brilliant. It was edgy, really, really edgy, cool stuff. But they said, Martin, a few months ago, our daughter came to us and said she was going to leave the fashion industry. And the reason why is, as a born-again believer, her Christian friends kept telling her it's vanity. I still get emotional when I tell this story. Her Christian friends had basically said, oh, that's not of God, that's all just vanity. You know? And in the middle of a meeting on a totally different subject, God stops me and says, prophesy onto your left area here. It's not vanity, it's glory. Everything is spiritual. Everything what if the fashion industry, what if the creative fashion industry, what if people in that were told, do you realize that what you're doing here is not just creative or soulful, it's actually deeply, deeply spiritual? It's funny how even the fashion industry is stereotyped with certain groups of people, and even more so. You know what's been interesting in the last 10 years, I've probably only told that story maybe 20 times in different environments, overseas, different places. Um, in one time when I was preaching in Switzerland, I had two of Europe's top models, and another time in Atlanta, um, come and talk to me afterwards, male and, in another case, two female models. And with the pastors and everyone were just sitting there and literally in tears, tell me how liberated they felt because they'd always been told that what they were doing as models was vanity and God was not in it. And then they'd tell me almost to the word how they know that area is so abused and they know all the trappings of it. But as born again believers, when they've tried to pull out, God has said, stay in a salt and light. And just amazing. And I always have a bit of humor and I say, do you think I'd make a good model? <laughs> and they're always so nice. They're like, and I said, look, it's okay. I, I do know I've got movie star looks. All my life I've been told I'm like a famous movie star. And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, yep, Rowan Atkinson. <laughs> Remove the beard, Mr. Bean. You know, I've got, no. <laughs> anyway, we always play up with that, have a bit of fun. So why am I telling you this? You know, everything is spiritual. Um, so what Paul does is he basically goes on and says, I observe that you are very spiritual in every way. And then out of that, he then starts to bring this revelation to them of Christ and the kingdom. And what you are worshipping in ignorance, I will now make known to you. Within the heart of every person is purpose. And the moment you start to talk to somebody about their purpose, they come alive. There are people who just love building things. There's people who just love restoring things. I shared a message last night about continuing the work of creation. I could have taken it further and said there are two categories of people, people who build and people who beautify. Hashtag find the ugly. Because some people want to find what's broken in society and ugly and needs to be beautified. And I've told you things. Homelessness, poverty is ugly. You want to see the beauty of care and welfare and, and, and providence in that. But what's really interesting is people have passions. You talk to the most pagan people and you touch their area of passion, art, business, their kids, and then you talk to them about the spirituality of it. I've never, ever yet seen someone not become responsive. 
I lie to people when I'm on a plane, when they ask me what I do for a job at first. Lie is a bit of a funny word. I'm teasing you, by the way. What I mean is I choose the way I describe it. I tell them I was a church pastor, but I never start with that. They'll say, oh, what do you do, what do, you do for work? And I said, oh, um, I do quite a number of things. I said, I primarily work um, in the area of transformation um, with organizations and individuals. And the person sitting next to me on a plane will be, some of those flights are 17 hours to Dubai and so on, right? Oh, wow, like, what do you mean? I said, yeah, we run a number of transformation organizations where we've identified things in our society. Uh, my home base is Auckland, where we've got a lot of issues to do with um, uh, dysfunctional work with young people and youth needs, youth not engaged in education, employment or training. Um, and we're actually running transformational projects. We work with governments internationally and locally and help bring change. Um, I said, we're faith-based, and I also, oh, I also pastor a church as part of this process. And you know what? That conversation continues. If they ask me, hey, what do you do for a job? I'm like, you know, oh, I'm actually a church pastor. They'll be, oh, look, that's great. Look, sorry, I'm just about to put my headphones on. <laughs> I've learned over time. You know what I mean? I don't lie. I just change the wording. But my immediate point when I go to that, and I say, oh, I also pastor a church and run that. And, and, and I just stop and I go, tell me about what you're passionate about, what you do. And, they, and then often they're like, no, I'm interested in what you're, I want to hear. And I say, well, come back to me, but what do you do? And sometimes I'll say, oh, I just do this. I'm like, well, tell me about what, the, tell me about what you like about that. What, I have these conversations, and I can tell you nine times out of ten that conversation will become spiritual. Not because I say you're a sinner and you need Jesus Christ, but I actually say, oh, my goodness. I said, do you realize what you're passionate about lines up with my values like you wouldn't believe? Because they'll be telling me about creativity or they'll be telling me about this. Or that. I had another story that, you know, 15 years ago I was in Oca Ocala, Florida. I'd flown in from Europe. I was working as a missionary there. I was meeting the pastor the next morning. I arrived at the hotel I was staying at at 10.30 at night in Ocala. I checked in. I was tired. I'd flown a long-haul flight. I was hungry. And I just wanted to get a burger and then go to sleep, right? And I flicked on the TV, put it on a Christian channel, and it was back in the days where Steve Hill was a revivalist preaching at Pensacola. And, and as I'm unpacking my bag and I want to go and get a hamburger, I hear him say, and you need to lead people to Jesus. And right now, wherever you are, get on your knees and say, God, use me today to win souls. And I'm like, I'm packing my bag and I'm like, God, use me today to win souls, right? And I'm, it's in the background. I carry on. I unpack my bags. I get in my rental car and I start to drive down. Now, in America, every off-ramp has a petrol stations and a Motel 8 and a Motel Formula 1 and, 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 a, and a Burger King. And so I'm just heading down towards there. As I'm driving down this, this strip of um, motorway, or not motorway, but highway, and then there's all these shops. In the distance, I, I see the sign way up and a whole bunch of things lit up. And I feel the Holy Spirit say, don't get takeaways, eat in. I just want to get a burger and go and sleep, right? And I see a sign way off in the distance. I can't even see the words on it. <laughs> I tested God. You know, I did, I did the Gideon thing, you know, with the fleece. I said, okay, God, if that sign is a place to eat, I'll eat in. And I'm hoping it's like a dry cleaners. The closer I get, I see the words Bennigan's. And I'm like, and then underneath it says bar and grill, right? So beer and food, right? That's awesome. It's cool. Oh, it's a place to eat. So I pull in. It's about 10.45 at night. Walk in. Hi, is the kitchen open? I'm hoping they're going to say no <laughs> so I can get takeaways. They say, yeah, yeah, for another half an hour. I'm like, cool. Go to a seat. There's only five, six people there. And I sit down at the table. Uh, server comes over. Young girl, probably, I don't know, 19, 18, 19. Hi, sir. I'm so-and-so. I'll be your server. You know, just get you some water. Comes back. And the Holy Spirit starts to speak to me and says, this is why you've eaten in. So anyway, she comes and serves me, asks me what I want, and I'm like, I'm going to just order this for a, a starter, and I have this as a main. She goes away, she comes back, and I just look at her and ask her name. Can't even to this day remember her name. But I said to her, so um, is this your main job? Or, and you saw me try to do this last night, actually, with one of the servers. Are you at university, you're studying, is this your main job in hospitality? I just said to this girl, is this your main job? And um, or anything else? She goes, oh, no, I'm actually studying. And I said, oh, that's cool. And I remember, this is, this is years before the story I told you about with Lucy. I said to her, what are you studying? And she says, oh, I'm actually studying fashion, and fashion design. I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And I said, look, I don't want to impose on you, but can I give you some advice, seeing you're involved in creative areas? And this was like 20 years ago, right? 15, 20 years ago. She says, sure, sir. And I'm like, seeing you're involved in creative work, can I suggest that you tap into the most creative source in the universe? And she looks at me and goes, 
you mean the internet? <laughs> and I just started to smile and laugh. I said, I said look, that's good. I said, no, I was, I'm thinking about the greatest creative source in the universe. She goes, what is that, sir? I said, well, I said look, I'm, I'm a person who believes in, in supernatural life. I actually believe there's a God, but I believe God's a God of creation. I said, every person I meet who's involved in creative stuff, who actually gets to know God, their creativity just blows like, like out like crazy. And I started talking to her, and I said, I actually believe it's the person called Jesus Christ, right? And she starts to tear up, and I know that because the bar security guy came over to think I might have been hitting on her or, or telling her off or something, and, and she's like, no, no, he's fine, he's fine, please go away, I want to talk to him. Right? And I'm sitting there, and I'm looking up at her, and, and she starts crying, she says, sir, you talk to me like my granddaddy, who I haven't seen for 10 years. She said, sir, I'm not even supposed to be working tonight, I'm filling in for a friend. She said, but what you said is what my granddaddy, she said, I used to go to church as a child. And she says, I've never been back. But she said, three months ago, something in my heart said I have to find a way back to God. I talked to her, and of course, because I'm traveling by myself, I didn't give her my phone number, I didn't get her details. But what I said to her is, I said, look, on your university campus, there'll be a group of people. They're the weird ones, right? <laughs> there'll be some Christians. By the way, this is a church in that, right? Why am I telling you this point? It's because if I just sort of said, oh, hi, hey, what's your name? By the way, I'm a Christian. Do you know Lord Jesus Christ? You know, I touched her passion reached into that whole area of life. And interestingly, as an aside, um, who was that famous designer who was shot? Um, yeah, the Italian guy. She had modeled um, with him, and she apparently told me afterwards that she was doing fashion and modeling. She said she'd actually modeled one of his garments two days before he was shot dead. And it was one of the impacts that made her believe that life has to have more meaning. So God moves people to their areas of passion and connectivity. I want to just show you something really quickly here. I know I'm talking a lot about vocation now, but I want to finish with this. This is the trust the chef part. We move on to the next screen. I've studied the influences of the scriptures. And I told you before the end of this, uh, before the last the end of the last session, that what I've found is that big doors swing on little hinges. Kingdoms move not on who's in control, but who serves those in control. If you look at every one of these influences, Esther, Joseph, Daniel. They all move the hearts of kings, pagan kings, to transform society. Esther saved a whole people group from genocide. Joseph fed the world in the biggest world famine ever recorded to date at that time. Daniel took the kings of the Babylonian Empire and brought them to faith in God to a point where even in Scripture, in the book of Ezekiel, God says he used people like Nebuchadnezzar as his servant. And they were all transformed by these three people. So I actually asked God a question five years ago. I sought God and I said, God, tell me the secret. Tell me the secret of these people. What was the key thing that enabled these influences to influence the kingdom of God, uh, influence these people? And when he told me, and I'm about to tell you, you're going to be offended by me and with me. Because I want to tell you the reason these people were successful in their influence. The reason is they were good looking. I knew I'd offend you. No, they were good looking. Read the next few verses. Next screen. Esther was lovely in form and features. Joseph was well built and handsome. Daniel, young men without blemish and handsome. Among these were Daniel. Next slide, please. Hey, good looking. Kingdom people are attractive. <laughs> I know I'm offending you because I'm offending myself. Because if kingdom people have to be attractive, I'm the least in the kingdom. Now, you think I'm self-defecating or whatever the word is. I, I'm not. I'm, 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 actually, I'm actually creating tension. No, not defecating. What's the word? <laughs> That's when you go poo, right? That's when you go number twos. What's the word? There's a word where you... Deg no, there's another one. Degre degrading, not defecating, degrading. I don't need to go to the bathroom. I'm totally in control of my movements. Some of you are like, you've lost the meeting. No, I haven't lost the meeting. But you are offended because I've said the key to influence is that they were actually good looking. Now, here's the key. Why do you think the Bible said and commented... Because it's an analogy of what being attractive really means. They were attractive. Do you know what the word attraction means? 
word attraction means that people are drawn, that people find favorable. Now, we're not talking about physical appearance. We're talking about the attractiveness of kingdom people. That was a physical analogy of a spiritual principle. Let me show you the next picture and you'll see what I mean. I'm going to show you the three of the most attractive people in the world. They are literally three of the most attractive people in the world. Because the word attraction means people are attracted to them. People find them with favor. People consider them attractive. Now, Mother Teresa is one of the most attractive people. If, if there was a crowd of five people sitting there and you could go and talk to one, you'd be attracted to Mother Teresa. Now, even when she was younger, she probably wouldn't have been on the cover of Vogue. But people say, you are beautiful because mercy is attractive. Love and care is attractive. Let's jump on to Bono. Oh, well, he's, he's a reasonably good-looking guy, but you know he's not Brad Pitt. But when he walks into the office of a president, and instead of singing Happy Birthday, Mr. President, like Marilyn did, he says, Mr. President, I challenge you, what are you doing to reduce third world debt in Africa? People go, you're awesome, Bono. Man, I love you. Wow, you're a, oh gosh, you're awesome, wow. Because charity is attractive. Oh, Nelson Mandela, he's a good looking guy, but he's not Denzel Washington. But I can tell you now, he's probably the most attractive politician that's been on this planet in the last hundred years. Attractive. Why? Because grace and forgiveness and reconciliation is so attractive. So when a man who's been oppressed, put in jail for his beliefs, put in jail because of his color, put in jail and when his son is killed in a car accident, is not even allowed to go and attend his son's funeral under guard. When those same people who oppressed him for 20 years he now ends up in power over them, does not extract revenge, but initiates reconciliation and forgiveness. People go, that is so attractive. The reason the Bible spoke about the influences of Esther and Daniel and Joseph and others in reference that they were attractive was not really focusing on their physicality. Although that may have been physically real, it's the analogy of the kingdom that God wanted us to understand. If you want to be an influencer when you're not in charge, lose the ugly. The ugliness of intolerance. The ugliness of self-righteousness. The ugliness of self-preservation. Next slide, please. Hmm. Martin, how, how am I going to be influential? Well, you understand everything you do is spiritual. How do I become a go-to person? Learn to be attractive. What are the things that will make a person in a, a place? And I'm going to finish with this emphasis. I wasn't meaning to go here, but trust the chef. I'll give you a theological evidence of what I mean. How do you think Esther entered the king's chamber when she was not allowed and to enter uninvited was an instant death penalty? You know the story. Haman tricks the king. The king is about to, you know, out, outwork and allow his people to annihilate the Jews. Mordecai comes to Esther and says, Esther, for such a time as this, you brought in the kingdom. You've got to go and, and, and beg the king to change the edict. And she's like, I can't. If I even enter his presence unannounced, I, I'm dead. If I try to tell him to change an edict, I'm gone. Look what he did with Vashti, the previous queen. Mordecai says, you've got to do something. And the Bible tells us that she was so beautiful that when she went and she opened the door and looked at the king, it says immediately, he says, come here. And then he said these words, Esther, you're so beautiful. Ask me anything and I'll give it to you. Even up to half of the kingdom. Now let's remove it away from Esther and bring it back to the church who is Esther. And we say, oh, the world never invites us in our opinion. The church is pushed away from politics and pushed away from media and pushed away from education. What if I said it's because we're not attractive enough? 
Because because of her attractiveness, the king says, wow, ask me anything. I'll give it to you, even up to half the kingdom. It's an analogy. It's a prophetic type. Jesus was not a rock. <laughs> but the rock, the Moses that, rock that Moses struck was a, a type of Christ. Esther is a type of the church. The king of Persia, Babylon, are types of the world. And I can tell you now, if Esther had walked in looking ugly, and ugly, by the way, is not the way we're all born, because we're all different. Beauty is how you present what you're given. If Esther had walked out there physically with you know, hair out of this and, and, and dirt all over and, and just, just a mess, he probably would have said, hey, I know, you, I know there's potential there. Come back tomorrow, right? It's an analogy. And that's what happens. The church walks into society and goes, hey, I want to have influence. And they go, gosh, you're ugly. Because the first thing they see from us is intolerance. The ugliness of intolerance. Then they see the ugliness of judgment. Then they see the ugliness of self-righteousness. It doesn't mean we don't hold values. But what does it mean to walk in with the beauty of acceptance? The beauty of charity. The beauty of mercy. What if, what if the church looked more like Teresa Bono <laughs> and Mandela? What if every kingdom of this world, from fashion to media to business to politics to education, went, oh, we need to get some of these Christian kingdom people in here because, man, they're beautiful. They have these beautiful words of solution to problems. They have these beautiful words of of reconciliation. They have these beautiful words of mercy. And hmm. I was flying to Christchurch yesterday. It's a good thing I did, so I'm here. I sit down, I'm in row 5, 5F, couple sit next to me, probably late 60s. Girl walks down the aisle, probably in her 20s. A couple of really cool, weird earrings. I still haven't researched to find out who she is. But the guy sitting on the aisle in 5D looks at her and goes, I saw you on the AM show this morning with Duncan Garner. You were awesome. You were amazing. People need to know more of what you're doing, and I'm going to help you. And she goes, she says, I'm just sitting in the seat behind you. He said, I'll give you my business card in a moment. And then I hear him whisper to his wife, that's the girl I told you about. You know, who's doing that thing? And from what I could lightly overhear is that, and I'll have to check it, but she's involved in something that's helping alleviate poverty in New Zealand or something like this, right? So I think. And then she says to him, and he answers in a quiet voice, but I'm in, I'm in 5F, he's in 5D. She says, sir, what do you do? He says, uh, he says not a lot. He said, I, ch I, I ch serve on the board and I chair about 10 companies in New Zealand, including one with 22,000 employees. And he says, I listened to your story yesterday and I will help you. I don't know if he's a believer. Maybe he isn't. I don't know if she's a believer. Maybe she isn't. But I saw what I'm trying to tell you. What happens when an Esther walks in and a kingdom business person, right? Because he's got a kingdom. It might not be even Christ, but he serves on 12 boards and chairs some of them with 22,000. Here is a king in the industry. sees an Esther. Had nothing to do with her physical appearance or her earrings. Although he did make the comment, the reason I knew it was you is you were wearing those earrings on the show, weren't you? And they were these big fluffy things, right? But what he was saying is, you're attractive. Because she was obviously presenting a model of solution to one of New Zealand's systemic problems. And I sat there loving what I was hearing, but at the same time grieving, thinking, you know, the odds are two-thirds to one-third, they're probably not even believers, any of them. But they're doing kingdom. What if somebody in this church or out of a church in Christchurch in the next five years realized that what you do is spiritual and whatever industry you're in, whether it's in trade or fashion or business or accounting or internet or, or, or innovation, you get a God thing on you that solves a problem in society so that when you walk down the aisle of a plane, a king or a queen in industry goes, up to half the kingdom. What if a Jacinda Arden's like, shh, shh, hang on, be quiet. I want her. I want a meeting with her. I want a meeting with that girl, that guy. 
And what if when we sit down, we're kingdom representatives working covertly as Daniels and Josephs and Esthers, and we win the affection, not through manipulation, but through representation. And the end result is they're like, man, you're attractive. Mercy, grace, solution, pretty much everything Jesus was. Because it didn't matter if you were a prostitute, it didn't matter if you were a tax collector, it didn't matter if you were a king, it didn't matter if you were a tax collector who hit up a tree. Ultimately, everybody wanted Jesus at their house. But they didn't want the Pharisee. And I don't believe there's a single person in this room who's pharisaical, and I don't believe there's a single church in our, in our city that is trying to be pharisaical. I just think we've lost a bit of our beauty. And I think it's all coming back. Amen? Let's pray. Would you stand with me today? You should have seen your faces when I told you the kingdom principle was that they're all attractive. You're like... <laughs> Please make sure every one of you when you leave, you do know what I meant by that. <laughs> Father, I thank you for the beauty of the kingdom. I thank you that the church is glorious, beautiful. I thank you that, Lord, the attributes of beauty, of mercy and grace and generosity and the culture of Christ, the culture of the kingdom. Lord, people say, what right do we have to bring kingdom culture into this world? Every right. Because we're restoring the beauty and the intention of God. We're fixing broken things. We're restoring things. You know, I just want to say this even as I'm praying. I want to prophesy this. There's two types of people. Some of them, as I mentioned before, you build or you beautify. If I gave you a piece of land and said, or a property, you know, choose. Some of you want to build on bare land and build new. Others, I want to find an old villa and do it up. Do you realize even that's indicative of your calling? There are some people here called to innovate and create. There's others here who are called to restore. And if you're someone who gets passionate about piecing, putting a piece of old furniture together and restoring it, an old vehicle or something, it's just like, wow, this is a, there's a thing in you to be a restorer. Others of you, you just love a blank sheet of paper and just go, I want to do something no one's ever done before. That's kingdom. That's spiritual. I release the grace of God upon your life to be unfettered, unhindered in the radical passionate pursuit of the reign of God in your everyday life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its rightness, its righteousness, its right order, and all these things will be added unto you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Ooh, that's interesting. There's at least three people in this room right now and you've got regrets over choices you've made. At least one or two of you, it even has to do with your vocation. Where you, when I talked about that fashion industry example with Lucy, you might not have anything to do with fashion, but you were thinking about things that you wanted to do once as a Christian and felt, oh, I can't do that because it's not spiritual. And you got regrets. Just trust God. Go there again, whatever that looks like. For some of you, it might literally mean that God's saying, it's okay, you can go and get into that industry. I apologize as a pastor on behalf of many pastors of 10, 20, 30 years ago, how some of the things we suggested to our young people not to become involved in. Jesus never said that he was going to take us out of the world. He said, I will sanctify you in it. And I'm just saying for those two or three people that, Get hold of God again and say, God, what do you want me to do to get back into that area? Um, I do feel one of them is to do with art. Art. I don't know what the other two are. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd restore, put us back into the callings of our vocation. Every believer is a minister. Every vocation is a ministry. The areas of our passion, vocation. Vocation is a voice we hear, not a decision we make. I don't know if you know that, but the word vocation literally comes from the word voxer. It means a calling you hear. When people say it's vocation, you're not choosing a job. 
It's not a choice, it's a calling. And there are people in this room who are doing jobs that you were never called to do because your parents' expectations that this is what you should do. Others, you've done it because of finance. You know, well, if I do this job, I can earn three times as much, and that job doesn't make money. Remember when my son came to me years and years ago, and he said, Dad, I've been you know, at school, and I started working in retail. He said, oh, it's just not my thing. And he said, well, I, I, I want to I go into the movie industry. I want to be a film camera person. And I'm like, well, that means you'll live by faith. <laughs> because you don't work, you don't eat. And he goes, I know. But I so easily could have said to him, no, no, don't do that. You know, one day you want to be married, have a family. You don't want to be involved in a, in a turbulent industry like the film industry. Like, today's one of New Zealand's most successful film camera people, works on the biggest movies, does great things. But the key to it is we never even knew that was an interest he had, and he didn't know until his teenage years, until my wife told me that when he was three years of age, she took him, when we were missionaries in Europe, she took him to a movie to see The Lion King when it first came out. And at three years of age, he sat in his seat, the movie started, and he was nearly 29, uh, this is 29 years ago, he was three years of age, and he turns around and he looks at the projection box where it used to be projected, and he looks at the light beam coming out and he just looks at the projection box. And at three years of age, my wife turned him around, sit down, David, look at the screen. He watches about a minute of The Lion King and turns around and just focuses on, this, on the projection box. She moves him, faces him forward. He did it three times. In the end, she thought, forget it, I'm going to watch the movie. My son, David, literally spent the whole of The Lion King, apparently, with his back to the movie, watching the projection box at three years of age of how light moved. I'm thankful for a wife who wasn't pedantic in OCD. I'm thankful for the people behind who probably thought it was Chucky the doll looking at them. <laughs> when you're watching a movie and a kid's facing you, right? But what I believe is that God called him into that industry even before he was born to be an influencer. It was already in him. What if I'd said, no, David, I need you to be a doctor because I didn't or a lawyer, and I wanted to be, and I'm going to live vicariously through you. Everything's spiritual. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Release your grace, your power upon this amazing, beautiful people here in Christchurch. Your kingdom come, your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen.